Yo, dudes and dudes, what's going on with y'all? This week I decided to look back into a book I read a long time ago but have since forgotten. I apparently loved the shit out of it since Audible informed me I left a glowing review. Upon checking it, I saw that I even equated it to the Circle series by Ted Decker, and if you're familiar with my channel, you'll know I love those books. But strangely, I can barely recall this one at all. Still, I am a hardened critic now, and nothing touches my cold, dead heart anymore. So let's see if this is really that great, or if I was just stupid. Spoilers abound, so skip to me final thoughts if y'all want to avoid plot details. So, we're introduced to a sergeant in the New Orleans PD coming up on a dead body of a homeless man who presumably drank himself to death, and this book is moist right off the bat. As opposed to, well, a lot of what I've read lately, honestly. This one scene is teeming with what seems like real life. He references a few of the other cops, including one who is a giant that often cries on the job. He references one who is a straight shooter and does volunteer work outside of his work hours. This second man, Cal, considers to be the pinnacle of a cop. We also learn about Cal's troubles remembering names, how his big brother has tried to teach him name association, and about how he ends up seeing a lot of the same first responders at crime scenes. All of this is great. It's moist. It's written about what feels like a real person, and I'm all about that. So, it turns out that a homeless man died, and we jump ship to his long-estranged daughter in California, Jillian, who is our primary MC. We get a brief overview of her life, and we see a strange combination of areas where she's been forced to mature rather quickly, primarily because of her mother's peculiar style of parenting. At one point, her mother Jay basically tells her to do whatever possible to hang on to her boyfriend because he's well off, even if that means estranging herself from her best friend and basically screwing that friend out of an apartment that said friend will never be able to afford on her own. However, in other ways, Jillian tends to be a little bit naive, such as letting said boyfriend handle all of her money, paychecks, and expenses because he's the one taking care of her, despite the fact that he regularly turns violent and is absolutely cheating. Hey, anyhow, once Jillian is informed of her father's death, she flies out to New Orleans at her grandmother's dime for the funeral. It's worth mentioning that New Orleans is written in a very immersive way and makes me suspect that the author either resides there or else has spent time there because it's given a very genuine and very real flavor beyond the scenes in California. We're introduced to several characters who all have quite strong personalities and stories. You know, like characters do. In particular, we see that Grandma has an interest in Jillian's life, but that she's very aloof and has great difficulty expressing care or concern. Couple that with an extreme distaste for Jillian's mother and Jillian's extreme stubbornness that tends to be a cornerstone for a life of young 20-somethings, and you have a brick wall between the two that even China would be proud of. Anyhow, it turns out that father was murdered instead of passing of natural causes as the police first thought. So the body gets held in the morgue and Jillian grows disgusted with a bunch of the people and life in New Orleans before she flies back to California and ends up missing the delayed funeral. Once back home, she finds out that boyfriend is cheating on her with another chick at work, and so after a long moment, she basically panics, knowing that her safety net is absolutely shot, so she steals a grand from him and flies back to New Orleans and basically begs for help. They, being good Southern hospitality types, chastise but agree to help her. Grandma lets her stay in the house, quote, until she can find a place, and over the course of a few weeks while Jillian gets things in her life more in order, the barrier between her and the other residents gets torn down over goofy moments such as chasing an escaped cat or watching a bird's nest of young cardinals. These moments are great and organic, but in a very slow and very believable way. We see the walls between Jillian and her grandmother slowly be brought down as Grandma makes moves towards a relationship with Jillian in a way that no one could ever call out or prove because she's a guarded old lady. For example, she regularly prepares Julian French pressed coffee that must be drank from a teacup because you should never ever drink good coffee from a mug and all the writers in the universe wince slightly. We also get more insight into why Mom and Grandma hate each other so much, and it's all very engaging and interesting. There's also a side plot revolving around dead dad named Rafe, and the need for atonement with a crazy stalker. And I won't spoil this plot here, but it's actually handled very well, even if it is a touch distracting at times. So, there's a lion's share of the praise, now let's balance it out a tad. What is extremely disjointed are the flashbacks to the 17th century and the founding of the church that would later become the hotel that Grandma owns. While these segments are short and not bad, they are also almost entirely disconnected from the story that we're trying to follow, and it's not in the book's favor to ask much more of us. They honestly are so out of place and they're very easy to forget, and while you might think that they connect back to the main plot, they don't really. Anyhow, major spoilers starting now, so if you want to read it, and you should, go ahead and skip to the final section. I'll give you a couple seconds here. It's eventually revealed that the friend that Jillian makes was the daughter of a family that got screwed over by Rafe's family, and Scylla tried to date Rafe so that he would marry her and give her money, you know, because she a thirsty hoe. That doesn't pan out, and so eventually she goes full psycho revenge mode, because why wouldn't you? Anyhow, a dude she basically scares into her employee attacks Jillian and almost kills her. She's eventually rescued by a cop from the start of the story. Now, you might think that this would be the climax of the story, and if this were a Sherlock Holmes or a Stephen King type story, it probably would be. But the third act takes a left turn. From here, character relationships are fairly solidified, 
and they're all well earned. Not all the people are created equal, of course, but I have no major complaints. Everyone seems to be painted with a fairly competent enough brush, and character writing is an ever decreasing art in this world, so I want to call attention to it whenever characters feel at least somewhat realistic without becoming overblown drama cows. Then we deal with a series of gut punches just one after the other. The books seem to decide, oh, hey, you finally like these people? We'll have a smack and a smack and a smack! And it does not hold back. PTSD, full blown shutdowns, emotional struggles, and the full on wailing of an old woman during a church service because she can finally and truly mourn the loss of her tormented boy who died miserable and alone. It all hits hard. It shows a difficult and broken road leading to recovery, and while it does head towards a relatively happy ending, there are also no magic wands that can fix everything that was broken overnight. It's really, really good, and honestly pumps the book's number up a fair bit. So, here's the final question. Is it as good as the Circle series? which I have held up as a wonderful book set that continually occupy my thoughts when reflecting on great Christian fiction. Were it not for Act 3, the answer would be an easy no. Not that Act 1 and 2 are bad by any stretch of the imagination, but they aren't amazing on the edge of my seat either. They're just good. However, as I say, the final chunk of it really starts earning a lot of payoff, and that considered, I'm prepared to say, while it may not quite hit the tier of a 9.5 that I gave to Black and Dark Harvest, my personal score is still a very solid 9 out of 10. I heartily recommend it to anyone who enjoys good thrillers, dramas, family hurt books, light romance novels, or just Christian fiction in general. Let's go ahead and take a look at that bingo card! And while we did have a couple scatterings of hits, honestly, it wasn't all that much. Well, you know, it's a good book. Anyhow, that's all for this time, so if you have something else you want me to review, go ahead and leave a comment down below. Let me know if you want to see what we get into next time. Go ahead and subscribe. Until then, drink plenty of water, tell your parents that you love them, and stroke your mustache at night. Wow. <sighs>